Hi, my name is Chris Mammon. I'm a partner uh, with the uh, San Francisco office of Hogan Lovells US LLP. And uh, I am uh, here today with uh, professors Justin McCrary and Tejas Narashenia. Uh, and we are going to talk uh, about the uh, IP applications of blockchain. First question to start off is, can you tell us uh, in, in simple terms, what is blockchain? Sure. So blockchain is a simple technology that allows you to have a record of financial transactions that doesn't require you to have an intermediary that would verify whether those financial transactions took place. So the easy way to think of this is, in terms of understanding why it's something everybody's talking about is to think of the cost associated with uh, A, the possibility of uh, cheating in connection with financial transactions that are recorded electronically, and B, the cost of monitoring <laughs> the, <laughs> that problem. And so the essential idea of blockchain is uh, we can actually get around that problem with uh, techniques that are barred from computer science and older ideas from computer science that basically allows us to build a database of transactions that's self-monitoring. Uh, is blockchain limited to financial transactions or does it have uh, perhaps broader application? In principle, it has broader application. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of keeping a record of all of the entries that have been made in a particular system. You could imagine other applications of that idea as well. Now, um, I know there's been some, some mystique about uh, who invented uh, the blockchain technology. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, who the inventor is? <laughs> so, so there's, a, there's a fictitious entity known as Satoshi Nakamoto who is responsible, or considered to be responsible, for having invented and really popularized the technology. We're not sure exactly who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Uh, it's a pseudonym for somebody who, to this date, remains unknown. Craig Wright, in a famous BBC interview, claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto. So Craig Wright is an Australian, goes on TV, says, I am, like, I am him, he is me. There's a lot of skepticism for that claim, and no one's really sure. Why does it matter who Satoshi is? So we have a system that's first inventor to file. And so the patent really only belongs to the inventor. And so being, being able to identify who or what Satoshi is, who in fact invented the technology and the particular application of the technology, is critical to being able to determine who ought to be entitled to the patent and the exclusive rights that flow from it. And so in, in, in talking about the patent, you're talking about perhaps some, some fundamental uh, technology patents right. on the blockchain technology. So, Craig Wright has filed for a number of patents. I think it's right. 50, more than 50. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of conceiving of it here as one patent that covers, or one set, maybe it's better to say one set of patents that covers the, the core set of blockchain technology. Uh, and whether or not Craig Wright is entitled to claim those patents depends uh, in part on whether or not he is or is part of the team that uh, that constitutes Satoshi. So let's let's play that out for a little bit. Now, if if Craig Wright is Satoshi and, and is awarded these patents, um, what are the implications of that on uh, the IP system for uh, for blockchain? In principle, it could have a real chilling effect on the utilization of blockchain. Uh, if Craig Wright is in fact uh, Satoshi, um, uh, a move to file this large number of, of patent applications uh, might actually be uh, sort of a, a public interest move, and I'm wondering if uh, if one of you could uh, could speak to that briefly. Sure. So, so some some entities, some companies, and some people have taken their patents and endowed them to the public. In, in the sense that they have promised not to enforce them. 
Uh, and so you could imagine Craig Wright or Satoshi doing something similar where they get the patents in order to prevent other people from claiming patents in this space. And is, are there reasons to think that, that something like that strategy, defensive strategy, might be consistent with the, uh, the spirit in which Satoshi released the original blockchain? So, so, so far, everything that Satoshi has done in this space seems to be consistent with the sort of open source ethos that also informs some of these endow patent endowment strategies. So if, if Craig Wright is not Satoshi, what does that portend for, for patent law? It raises some interesting inventorship questions and challenges. Um, so certainly there's an inventorship question. The challenge, though, is you know, who, would, who would bring the inventorship claim? Would Satoshi have to out himself, herself, itself uh, in order to actually challenge Craig Wright's claim that he was the inventor? But even if you have a situation where it's established that Craig Wright is not Satoshi Nakamoto, isn't it also possible that you could apply uh, for a patent with a utilized blockchain in a new way, where you are simply saying the thing that is being invented here is not blockchain, but rather it's the pylon of the utilization of blockchain to some specific application? Right. I think so. That I think that's possible. Um, it would depend a little bit on exactly what's in the set of fifty patents that right. Craig Wright is applying for. Um, but even those raise some really interesting questions. So, you know, what the content of, so depending on what the content of those patent applications is, uh, there are interesting questions about patentable subject matter and obviousness uh, and, and whether or not these things should be patentable. These are interesting and I think very much open questions. Even if Craig Wright is not applying uh, for patents on Satoshi's inventions, but rather on Craig Wright's improvement inventions on blockchain. Uh, he may, there may be, may or may not be some patentable subject matter there. Yeah. Okay. Now, are there others uh, besides Craig Wright who are active in the patenting space for blockchain? Yes. Definitely. And I think it's also fair to say that we probably don't have any idea of the outer bounds of the number of entities that are currently uh, considering uh, patenting particular applications of blockchain. But we, in terms of industries, you know, going back to your earlier question, we've seen, I, I think that there are people in the financial services sectors that are seeking patents on blockchain related technology, also in telecommunications sectors, in computing sectors. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide and growing range of companies that are seeking to patent aspects of the technology or particular applications of the technology. What should we uh, what should we expect to see um, as this uh, this becomes fertile ground for patent applications and maybe uh, Professor McCrary, you want to talk about that from a from an economics perspective? Well, I think one uh, problem from an economic perspective is that you shouldn't grant the patent if it turns out the innovation was going to take place in the absence of the patent. Uh, so that's. Uh, a very simple idea. It's of course hard to know uh, exactly what would have happened in the absence of uh, such a patent, but as a, as a conceptual matter, the patent system should be there to encourage innovations that you think wouldn't have occurred without that patent. That's the reason for its existence. And if you think that there is something that is a small enough improvement that somebody would have done it uh, very rapidly, even without a patent, then that's something where you don't need the patent system to encourage that type of innovation. Whether that's the same thing as the legal test for what's patentable is, of, uh, of course, uh, you know, a question where I think we both know that the answer is no. <laughs> the economic principle is not uh, what the legal test is. But from an economic perspective, the thing that we should all be worried about is patent activity that actually doesn't have the uh, result of encouraging innovation, but actually has the result of discouraging innovation. Uh, and I think that it's a, an open question whether that type of concern is valid here. But I also think it's right that uh, it's at least time to consider whether that's uh, going to take place. Do you have, it, from a patent law perspective, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think one other thing we're likely to see is some litigation. 
<laughs> really? I think we're going to see <laughs> some challenges, uh, not only to the Craig Wright patents, but also to some of the other patent applications that have been filed, because there are a lot of open questions here. And I think people are going to want to know what is and isn't patentable in this new and exciting space. Do you think that that is going to be just a natural extension of the uh, controversies and questions that have arisen out of the Supreme Court's Alice decision, or do you think there are some special uh, features uh, in blockchain that will, will take that to a new dimension? Uh, so I think a little bit of both. I think that you know we're definitely going to see some sort, some of the Alice type patentable subject matter challenges, but I think blockchain presents uh, uh, something of a new challenge. We're going to see something of a new challenge because I think blockchain is a particular type of algorithm that sits on a computer. So if Alice says using a computer isn't enough of an inventive step, it's an interesting and open question whether or not using blockchain, which is itself a algorithmic computer-based implementation, is enough of an inventive step to get you past the Alice test. And that's something that I think is new and remains to be seen. You know, if we assume that um, uh, that there's a, a strategy uh, of, of filing the fundamental patents um, as a defensive approach to get uh, to get those committed to the public, dedicated to the public, uh, does filing uh, a, a large number of improvement patents on top of that uh, tend to impede or defeat that kind of a defensive strategy? It seems like it could easily defeat it. You know, say in the, in the end, um, do patents in a new technology like this, or the, the particular patents we've been talking about, tend to encourage in innovation, reward innovation, or do they discourage downstream innovation? So I would, uh, I would say that it's, there's several open questions in this space. But one uh, open question for sure is whether patenting activity in this space is going to discourage the use of uh, blockchain or whether it's uh, going to encourage it. Uh, I'm concerned that it might have the, uh, the impact of discouraging it. Okay, thanks. Anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, there's a really difficult empirical question, which is whether or not we would have more or less innovation and of what kind if we didn't have the patent this particular patent or the patent system in general? Uh, the thing that's really interesting is uh, blockchain is something that was specifically following in the uh, thought stream of the open source community. And the open source community is something that exists in a world with patents and yet is specifically trying to put everything into the public domain. And so in a way we have this odd collision of worlds where if, if you think of the open source community in the world with patents, uh, the attempt is made to give to the public, and then the question is whether patents basically allow that, again, to be taken back.